Hey, hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar about hydrogen. It's a part of a series of webinars where we earlier have been looking into various initiatives, experimental large scale industrial projects, strategies, and we've been listening to actors from different sectors industry, public sector, energy sector, venture capital, entrepreneurs, and experts. Uh, this uh, webinar series are managed by University of Linköping, uh, managed by Professor Tang, Jakob Reme, and Pontus Rin, uh, jointly with uh, Sustainable Innovation, our skilled communication team, and myself, Roland Elander. Uh, today, we are eager to introduce a new concept. We have an international outlook, and we are really looking forward to hear from the forerunners in the Canadian market, as well as, as forerunners, and also the extensive efforts and funding opportunities from the European Union, Union all in order to, to get an international outlook and also to get input for what could be done in Sweden later on. Uh, this seminar webinar is uh, in two parts. Uh, first, we will introduce uh, Professor Jakob Breme, which will moderate the first parts from European Union. And then Pontus Serin will moderate uh, the second part with Canada's strategy for hydrogen and research. So uh, I'm happy to introduce Jakob Breme, moderator for the first session. Welcome. Thank you very much, Roland. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon, and I'm, I'm very happy that we have uh, so di distinguished uh, speakers here today as well. My name is Jakob Priame, and I'm a professor of uh, industrial uh, management, and I've been working together with uh, Pontus Serin and Otang. And uh, we've been working with about energy uh, markets, very much about business models and the different, you know, the new innovation in terms of how uh, the, the new system can actually work. This project that we've been working on for, for a number of years is about um, hydrogen on the Swedish energy market. And uh, we've been working on this for a number of years, and we can see that things are really taking off uh, I mean, just recently with a lot of different uh, hydrogen initiatives. Uh, and I could say that, um, I mean, like, as I think we all know with the situation about this summer, with the weather, this has been accentuated even more. And, you know, we have, I mean, like we have um, uh, colleagues or friends here from, from Canada and the, the, the record temperatures up in Canada. You know, we had record temperatures in Sicily, uh, a lot of flooding in Germany and also here in Sweden. Uh, and all of this has really, really put this at the forefront. So going from a situation where, where we've been thinking about this for the future, I think, the future is really now. And um, what, we, what we're going to start off, like Roland was saying, is about how the thinking is in terms of uh, about new initiatives and how to implement new projects uh, on an European perspective. Uh, and therefore, I'm really happy to introduce three of our first speakers, which are uh, Nadine Holzinger from Spilett New Technologies, Pedres Guedes de Compos, I, I think you have to correct my pronunciation there, Pedro. And he's from a fuel cells and hydrogen joint initiative, a joint undertaking uh, from the uh, EU, the big EU project, and uh, last but not least, Roland Schulze from the European Investment Bank. And I'm really happy that you could join us here today, and I'm really looking forward to an interesting the discussion with you people. Okay, so um, according to the um, the agenda. I think it's uh, first up is Nadine, or is it Pedro? I'm sorry, I can't see the agenda now. 
Well, if we're looking at the agenda, it will be me, but uh, feel free to, to shift to Nadine if you so No, like. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Pedro, please. Okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Pedro Gadget Campus. That's the right pronunciation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can give it a spin that. as well, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it was not that far for, from, from the original. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, by the way. And uh, allow me to share my screen just to go straight to the, to the, to the presentation. Just a second, please. Yeah, I believe you see the presentation now. Okay, so um, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm uh, a financial engineering officer at the Fuel Sustainable Hydrogen Charter Undertaking, uh, and I'll be here presenting uh, a few slides on green hydrogen industrialization in Europe and beyond. Just uh, uh, one slide to present uh, the institution uh, that uh, that I'm happy to work for. It's a it's a joint undertaking between the 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 industry, the research, and the commission. Uh, and that's the beauty of it, because in, in its governing board, we have all three entities sitting. And um, despite being pushed by the industry, we really bring along the, the hat of, of the commission and ensure a, 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 low, a, a big policy uh, feedback. Uh, because of course, uh, our funding and what we manage is Horizon 2020, which is part of the European Commission budget. So uh, basically, we, we have been uh, going around since 2008. Um, we, we still have a mandate until 2024, but we will be renewed in, into a new clean hydrogen and joint undertaking uh, already from, from 2021 onwards. Uh, but until now, we, we have run uh, 200, and we are running 285 projects supported uh, by Horizon 2020 with 1 billion euro, roughly. Uh, and this adds to 1 billion, at least 1 billion, billion from the industry. So basically, uh, we divide this budget into energy, transport, and cross-cutting pillars. And uh, I mean, it's, it's quite uh, well and balanced, uh, this type of projects. I will not extend further, and I guess you will see it later on, uh, how we've been um, employing our money in, in a correct way. Just to mention that uh, within the industry grouping, we have half of, of, the, of the members, uh, which are small and medium-sized enterprises. And this is very important because it's a very large ecosystem with uh, fully established companies, but also with newcomers every, joining every day. The number is, has been growing uh, quite significantly in the last couple of years, uh, but also on the side of, of the research grouping. So that would be my main message here. Uh, so this, is, this will be the slide that will lead my, my presentation. Um, what are the key factors and how we address them at European Union level? Um, basically, for green hydrogen industrialization, we need uh, to, to work on the cost factors, uh, both on side of CAPEX and on the OPEX, capital expenditure and the operational expenditure. This means working on the assets, uh, but also ensuring that the cost, which is mostly uh, related with electricity, uh, is also addressed. For this, we have to optimize, optimize and optimize. We need economies of scale. And that's why at the center of the slide, you have economies of scale. We need to reach those economies of scale. We need market synchronization uh, to, to ensure the, uh, the link between production, infrastructure and offtake of, of hydrogen. I'm getting rid of this chicken that, that we have been uh, hearing uh, for so long. We have also to, to ensure access to cheap renewables, renewable energy sources down there. Um, which will deliver the low cost green power and green hydrogen. And then um, ensure that with these, we actually uh, create the, 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 the certainty in the market to allow for a full industrialization. This is where we reap the economies of scale that we, that we aim at. And on the right side of the slide, you see how we address it. Uh, we work on policies on the ecosystem that I just mentioned before. And then uh, I will go all the way down to, to through this, this diagram in the next slides. But um, it's about the demo projects that we, that we fund. It's about research and innovation. It's about assessing early business cases and project development assistance uh, to ensure that uh, regions and other beneficiaries or promoters, project promoters can actually deploy the projects. And then it's about the, the hydrogen value concept, which has extended from uh, a European concept, a, an FCHG concept to an European and now to a worldwide uh, concept, uh, which is spreading around. Okay, policies. I mean, um, fuel cells and hydrogen, they tick all, all the boxes of, of, the, of the energy policy. 
uh, I mean, it's it's about competitiveness, it's about energy security and sustainability. So all the three ticked. Um, it's about competitiveness because of the research uh, that we do uh, and that creates uh, leading companies and therefore uh, leading jobs as well, well-paid jobs, um, wherever you actually do this research and uh, industrialize later on. It's, it takes the energy security because you do increase uh, uh, independence in terms of outside regions and fossil fuels, uh, basically because you, and then you take the sustainability box because you use uh, renewables to, to produce that hydrogen. Um, it's, it's amazing because it, it's an energy carrier that actually allows the, the, the sector coupling uh, all the way. I mean, all the sectors are, are, can, can be addressed from transport to energy production, to the chemical sector, uh, you name it, it's, it's, it's all over. And that's why uh, within the European Green Deal, uh, which was launched in, in December 2019, uh, we had uh, a huge, um, let's say, push from the Commission uh, to increase, I mean, the targets are there and the climate ambition is there. Uh, from the onset, it has increased in terms of, of targets. We are now aiming at net zero greenhouse gas emissions by, by 2050 in, in, at European level. We have member states that are, are going uh, even faster. Uh, and we have all these instruments and we have been pushing the boundaries. So uh, in gray, you see the, the targets that were in the past. In blue, you see the new targets and you see the ambition growing and growing for 2030 and then for 2050. But as I was saying, the European Green Deal comes with a pack. It's the European Industrial Strategy, uh, first of all, which was announced in, in March 2020. Then um, immediately after the recovery, the recovery plan for Europe, uh, already navigating on, on this um, crisis uh, related with the pandemic. And then uh, we, we had the launch of the hydrogen strategy at the same time as the energy integration strategy and also the Clean Hydrogen Alliance. Um, again, uh, highlighting the, the fact that the ecosystem is key uh, to deliver all the, 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 the benefits of it. Now, looking at demos, research and innovation, uh, demonstration and demonstration, oh, sorry, research and development, innovation and demonstration projects. Um, just an example on the electrolyzers, we've been growing from 2011, and you see the 20, 150 kilowatt capacity electrolyzer from Don Quixote, a project of ours, uh, back in 2011, all the way up to 20 megawatts uh, in the project of 2018 called Jules. And uh, this is in impressive because it's uh, all these projects have been developed in, 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 very, in various uh, sectors. And uh, you see how it can be used all over the economy to bring the, and decarbonize the hard to abate sectors. The next steps will be for sure. Uh, for example, Jules is already following up on, on a 60 megawatt uh, electrolyzer uh, right now, same players. And we have the Green Deal call that um, raised the appetite of 16 proposals uh, to on a topic uh, to install a 100 megawatt electrolyzer. So this is growing and growing. We also have the innovation fund, so a lot of firepower from the commission side. Um, and this innovation fund attracted, I mean, a quarter of, of, of the proposals uh, for large and small scale, small scale projects are related with hydrogen, just for you to, to have an idea on, on how big this is. But this comes with, with, a, with, a, with a scale up challenge. Uh, it's about new manufacturing processes to lower cost and increase capacity and lifetime. So we also do also, we, we assess also the early business cases and this is critical. So in addition to, to research innovation and deployment, which you see on the left side of the slide, we, we assessed early business cases. This is an example of the mobility uh, business cases that you have been assessing, uh, namely hydrogen fueling stations, cars and buses, trucks, trains and airplanes uh, in, in, in the last couple of years. But we also assessed the business case of power to hydrogen uh, on its own. And this is an example of, of what we got in June 2017. Basically, at that, time, at that point in time, we had this picture where we could uh, relate the price of electricity with the size of the electrolyzer to reach the, um, the price of the hydrogen that you would get out of it. So what you see there is that at, with a six megawatt electrolyzer, by the, the with the technology that you had in 2017, if you were able to get 20 euros per megawatt hour of for the electricity price, you would get the 2.5 euros per kilogram hydrogen, green hydrogen. 
And this is quite impressive. But then you, if you fast forward to 2025, which, is, which was part of, of the study, we see that with the same 20 euros per megawatt hour, you would get 1.5 euros per kilogram of hydrogen. And you could go further down if, if you size it up to, to a bigger electrolyzers, let's say 100 megawatt uh, electrolyzers. So basically, uh, the key variables for this profitability would be the size of the electrolyzer, the time to deploy, meaning that the maturity of the technology would be key. The deployment rates, uh, if you have, um, if you do deploy more, you will allow the industrialization and therefore you reap the economies of scale that come along. Then uh, also the value of the hydrogen, if it's just for mobility, which was the case in, in, in 2017, you would get some value because uh, it would compete with, with directly with, with, uh, with gasoline or, or, or diesel. Uh, but then uh, if you're going to other sectors, uh, other hard to abate, uh, sectors, you would need to go at, at a lower cost. And therefore, you have to ensure that you get the other services of hygiene uh, being factored in and being priced accordingly, namely the grid services that electrolyzers can deliver uh, for the electricity grid. Then um, it's about electricity cost for sure. Uh, one uh, interesting point here is that the study was done for 98% of, of, of load factor for the electrolyzer. Recent studies shows, show us that actually, if you want, if you're looking for the lowest cost of electricity, which accounts for 80% of, of the whole cost of, of green hydrogen, then uh, a 50% load factor would probably deliver the lowest cost of, of, of electricity uh, because uh, there's fluctuations in the market on a daily basis. Then, uh, I mean, you, you could argue, oh, but 20 euros per megawatt is quite cheap. Well, not really. In Portugal in 2019, you actually got 14.8. Uh, Years per megawatt on an auction for a 150 megawatt uh, photovoltaic plant. On average, for a 115 uh, gigawatt tender, uh, you got 20 years per megawatt hour. Again, PV in, in August 2019. In the UK, you get 50 years per megawatt in September 2019. And this is going down and down, as you see in this slide. Then uh, it's also about the combination and uh, ensuring that hydrogen at scale does effectively integrate volatile and intermittent renewable energy sources. By doing this, you have to look at PV and wind all together and uh, ensure that um, uh, you, you account for the, the critical uh, overlap of, of both, um, both energy sources, but ensure that you reach the 50% load factor. Uh, and this is achievable in several regions, uh, in several places in Europe and the world, uh, as you see in the map on the right. Now, uh, what we do also at the FCGU is look at, we develop initiatives to support regions um, and also the, to give policy feedback, as I mentioned before. And two of those were the regions initiative back in 2016 and the value change uh, initiative back in 2019. Well, while the later uh, actually uh, led to the insight to the important projects of common European interest, which was picked up by DG Grow at European Commission level, and uh, the, 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 the first one, the Regions Initiative, led, was the predecessor of, of three initiatives that we further developed. The Hydrogen Valley and the Hydrogen Island uh, in 2019 and 2020 calls. The PDA, the Project Development Assistance, in 2019 to 2021. And the European Hydrogen Valley uh, Smart Specialization Strategy Partnership, which was uh, further helped by the DG Grow and, and created uh, another ecosystem which does not only include regions, uh, I'm sorry, does not only include industry and research, but also the regions that are willing to support those projects. Um, then we get the new, commission com the, the new commission coming in and our president saying that she wants the next generation EU to create new European hydrogen valleys. This is very good. This is um, the way Europe sees the energy transition moving forward and how, to, how this delivers power uh, clean power to industries uh, and, and vehicles, and also uh, economic development to Europe. We did that, and we're doing that, and uh, going to project development assistance, we launched it in, in, in uh, 2020, and uh, it actually uh, has led to, has, has supported 11 uh, regions in, in Europe, uh, including Eastern Europe, which was not used to be a, a player in hydrogen, uh, but actually uh, showed a lot of appetite. And we have been uh, working also with Spilett, which you, and Nadine, uh, who will present later on. Um, we, we have been able to, to 
move these projects forward with a very nice um, capex um, and, and expected ex um, expected investment plan uh, coming in. We also did the hydrogen values, as I mentioned before. We started off with big hit, um, and then we moved in 2019, as I mentioned, uh, to the to the north North Netherlands in Groningen with the hydrogen valley. Uh, full hydrogen valley, uh, fully fledged, with uh, with from mobility to to aviation. I mean, uh, road mobility to to aviation, to um, inland water transport, domestic heat applications, underground storage. You name it; it has it all. And then we also launched the, the islands, uh, which is also a very interesting project in in uh, in Mallorca, uh, a Spanish island. And uh, it's possible that we that we look into further. Um, Hydrogen Valley concepts for ports, airports, industrial hubs, logistic hubs, hydrogen cities. I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunities there. The goal is and was to 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 develop this as as a, a way to ensure the offtake and therefore mitigate the risks of 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 hydrogen production and usage. And uh, this concept was was uh, became a global phenomenon when we when we worked with Mission Innovation. As you know, in the Mission Innovation, uh, the European Commission co-leads the, the, the Innovation Challenge for Hydrogen, um, together with Australia and Germany, and Canada is part of it, um, by the way. And uh, we took, to, on behalf of the, of the Commission, uh, the, the ownership of this task and created a platform that actually links uh, the, the, most, uh, the, the, the most prominent valleys around the world. We have we, we understood that there were three basic archetypes for hydrogen valleys. Uh, started off starting off with local and small scale uh, for mobility uh, usages, but then um, growing to industrial uh, focused um, valleys um, and even larger scale pr uh, projects, which include export uh, international export of hydrogen. And, but there are still, we, we, we release a final report in, in, in uh, June, uh, and you will see in the key insights, if you so wish, uh, that there are still barriers for hydrogen, and uh, including uh, obtaining public funding uh, in, as we go into 2030, and Rick Deacon is a skill that I was mentioning before, and um, also uh, uh, the barriers related with off-taking. Uh, so it's very important to sign long-term contracts to make projects bankable. Uh, it's important to ensure technology readiness of all fuel cells and hydrogen applications required. I mean, this is the way you ensure the offtake, right? And then uh, you need to ensure an adequate legal regulatory support, um, either in terms of carbon pricing, standardization, fast permitting, you name it. But basically in Europe, we're doing this and this is quite relevant. So key, take key takeaways from my side, um, there are plenty of examples of success stories. Uh, in terms of, of, of delivering projects and making the industry research and policymakers ambition. And this is what we show with the agenda they're taking here in Europe. CapEx is still an issue, but so is electricity, electricity price. You can actually work on a 50% uh, load factor um, to ensure lower, to size the electrolyzer down uh, and also ensure the, 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 the lowest cost of electricity. Cheap renewables uh, delivers cheap hydrogen, and therefore sector coupling is a must. You corporate power purchase agreements for low cost green electricity enable the, the power to hydrogen um, linkage because you get steady, steady, steady um, financial flows uh, that allow for uh, project finance uh, in both sides of, of the equation, meaning the electrolyzer and the renewables that come along with it. And local demand is very, is very important, uh, so, and therefore it's, it's important to have agreements uh, from the beginning uh, and ensure these mitigation strategies uh, to, to allow the bankability of the projects. It takes time and expertise to see projects off the ground, so that's where why we funded the project development assistance and we're looking at technical assistance from member states as well. But the EU is equipped with a complete and up and running ecosystem of stakeholders, including motivated regional partners to deploy its innovative technologies and uh, the EU is committed policy and budget uh, wise to support hydrogen industrialization and enable the fastest energy transition possible. And that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro. Um, 
uh, we have uh, we we are inviting all the the participants also to to post any question you have. You can post them in in the chat, and I can I can take care of them. Uh, I have we have time for uh, a, uh, start my video. Yes. <laughs> Uh, we have a, a time for a, a few short questions, and I. It's it's uh, the first one is basically, do you feel in in terms of you've been working with the joint undertaking for hydrogen, that the political ambition has been increasing recently in in terms of hydrogen, or is that and and how important is that? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. The positive feedback that you bring provide that you are providing to to the European Commission has delivered. Uh, you wouldn't have an, uh, an European hydrogen strategy uh, if it was not if that was not the case. Actually, the system integration strategy was supposed to include hydrogen in it, and at the very end, because of, of the increased appetite from, from the European Commission, it was um, separated and and uh, therefore it generated a, a, a European hydrogen strategy. If you have a strategy dedicated to hydrogen, that's clear. Uh, everything is 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 in uh, aligned to, to move forward. And you see also several member states, uh, big and small, looking at hydrogen and creating their own strategies to deploy with countries like uh, the Netherlands, for example, uh, looking at the decarbonization of the gas grid uh, as of 2030 on the back of hydrogen. And but it, the, uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Pedro. Yeah, I, I would just complement with uh, by saying that there's a lot of firepower from the Commission. You have the, yeah. the innovation fund. You have the, the uh, in addition to Horizon 20 and the follow up, which will be Horizon Europe, and um, which will keep on managing uh, for fuel cells and hydrogen. Um, there will be uh, we, there's new firepower from the recovery and resilience facility, which has to be deployed uh, pretty quickly in the next couple mm. of years. And which is uh, at least 37% of it is dedicated to climate. And I'm pretty sure, and I've been seeing a lot of strategies from the member states, which ensure that uh, a big chunk of, of these will be dedicated to, to green hydrogen, which is very, which we welcome uh, very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Really interesting. Uh, I think we could move over now to Nadine. Uh, if you could uh, do your presentation now. Okay, so uh, thank you, um, Jakob. I will open my presentation and hopefully you can see it uh, now. Okay, so thanks for the invitation uh, to talk here about the experiences we have uh, in our work or the lessons learned from, from our work with regions. Um, I will present a slightly different approach than uh, Pedro did because he brought uh, the perspective of the EU or of the broad strategies. And uh, we are now uh, just switching the perspective to the regions and uh, looking at how regions think, how regional stakeholders approach um, the implementation of hydrogen. So on a very, very, um, um, uh, uh, very uh, regional level. And um, I first want to start with a brief introduction of our company. So we are a small consultancy company from Germany. We uh, have focus on um, energy transition and hydrogen economy from the very beginning. So uh, we were founded 2007 in Berlin. And my personal experience is now 16 years with hydrogen and of which are 10 years with uh, regions. Um, and we have a very broad um, approach. Uh, so we're supporting regions, uh, industry and, and um, administration in all um, phases of the introduction of or the development and introduction of hydrogen economy. So from the idea to the everyday life, from the concept stage uh, to the project development, um, the evaluation of projects, the acceptance management, decision support tools, uh, networking. So we, we try to support regional stakeholders in getting through the process and be successful in what they plan to do. So maybe let me first start with the challenges that uh, regional stakeholders face when they want to just start or to process to continue the energy transition is that we indeed have less time left than expected to reach the goals. So um, here is a kind of a climate budget clock and um, I downloaded it yesterday. So um, you can see that in order to reach the two 
degree scenario, we have 25 years left to have a global CO2 free world um, in order to reach the 1.5 uh, degree scenario. We have only seven years left to decarbonize globally. So this is something that um, shows us that um, there's a pressure in, in, in the game and that we need to accelerate. And this is uh, the challenge that um, regions face is that they need to restructure their energy systems while they don't know so the solution yet. So they need to start now without having the blueprints, without knowing where to go So uh, and with learning on the way. Um, so there's a, a second challenge that they face. This is that uh, when you look at this uh, picture, um, um, I took it from the from the pick, uh, Potsdam. Um, so in order to reach the two degree goal, this would mean that of the 15,000 gigatons CO2 um, equivalents that is in the fossil fuels uh, below um, the, the, the ground, uh, we are only allowed to release 1,000 gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere during this century. So this would mean that 89% of the coal resources, 63% of crude oil resources, and 64% of fossil methane needs to remain in the ground in order to, to uh, keep the climate change manageable. Um, so in the end, this mean, means that the free market won't fix it so that we have neither a scarcity nor an economic um, incentives for change. So this is just something that needs to be um, for, uh, that, that just comes from, a, from a, um, the need to um, save the climate and not the need um, from an economic perspective. So there are many people in the world, many companies in the world that gain money with these resources and they will not be happy to change. So we need to change, although there is a business case in the fossil fuel economy. Uh, so what, it, what does it mean energy transition from a regional perspective or from a, yeah, from a region's perspective? It, it means that they, we need to build bridges that are sustainable and that people are willing to use. So they need to, uh, to hold, so they need to, to do what they are expected to do and people need to, uh, to go over it. So um, the solutions we, we have to develop, they um, have to be technically feasible they have to be energy efficient and economic viable. But um, the question is, will the solutions we develop for one region or for one case um, also work in other environments with more traffic or with more um, um, uh, people using it? And do uh, all people feel comfortable um, using these technologies and these new systems? So the challenges um, of the energy transition is um, that we need, in addition to the um, uh, criteria we set up in the past, the technical feasibility, energy efficiency, and economic viability, um, we also need to consider for a successful technology solution um, the three other criteria. This is time, the time to restructure the infrastructures and market models of energy production, distribution, storage, and use, and the time for learning. So the new technology system um, is required to um, let us learn, to develop blueprints, to make mistakes, to just refine strategies. So um, it will be, I think it will not be successful to have one big investment into one technology. And in the end, when we fail, we have a problem. So we need to somehow uh, decentralize the energy system and to set up in parallel different solutions in order to understand what the best way will be. So the technical solution or the new solution, energy system solution, will also need to be resilient. And resilient not only um, in regard to security of energy supply, um, but also, for example, um, the main argumentation is always we need to somehow smoothen the fluctuations of, um, of uh, renewable energy supply and just um, 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 adapted to, uh, to the demand curves, but we also need to have secure, security of energy supply in regard to um, failures, to sabotage, to, um, to all these other interruptions that may occur. Sometimes we have, we saw now in the US when you have a storm and you, and you, you have your grid, your electricity grid falling down and the people have no electricity um, supply anymore, then um, you need to have a separate system that is able to secure the energy supply. 
So this is also an important factor for the new system, as well as the cost stability, so resilience towards developments in resource policy or economics, um, and so like global security of supply and global security also of cost. So um, because there will be huge acceptance problem when you install systems that will become more, more and more expensive in the future due to external um, um, developments. But we also need to set up a system that motivates people to follow, to join, and also to, um, to go the way for change without knowing um, where, we, where we end up, so um, to learn on the way. So we need to motivate investors to leave the established path and go for uh, forego short-term returns business models. We need to motivate energy consumers to change their behavior and engage in new pricing models, for example, to accept new um, um, yeah, um, uh, development, uh, uh, business development models. And we also need to motivate politicians to set the uh, regulatory framework conditions to secure the put a political support. So in the end, what we already heard in, in Paolo, Carlos presenta uh, in Pedro's pre presentation uh, was that hydrogen and fuel cell applications are ready, they are there. And here you see in this chart that they are also um, timely cost ex um, competitive to other low carbon um, alternatives. So they are there, they are um, um, cost competitive or will be cost competitive in the near future. Um, so now the question is how could hydrogen technologies help us in the energy transition? Um, how could we gain time in order to learn? How could we improve resilience of our energy systems during the transition phase and in the future? And how could hydrogen technologies help to motivate people going um, through this energy transition phase? Here's an example of how hydrogen may build bridges. Um, um, gain time to learn and rebuild energy systems. So when looking at, for example, here it's a stationary energy supply. So the, the heating of houses and the electricity supply for housing. So you can see that in the future, you can do um, heat and electricity supplies for, uh, for, um, yeah, for neighborhoods and, and housings easily with hydrogen by using renewable energies, for example via an electrolyzer producing hydrogen, either producing it on site or having a hydrogen delivery, putting it into a, a fuel cell in order to either um, use the, um, the electricity directly or um, support a, a heating pump um, in order to, yeah, to um, right size all the technologies to make um, hot water, to make heat for the houses and so on. So this is the future system, but in the meantime, before, uh, we set up the, the future system in all the infrastructure that is required to deliver, to supply the hydrogen. Um, we are also able to have part of the system operated in the old system or in the current system, for example, with methane um, or a mix of hydrogen and methane in the, in the transition phase. So we could, can set up the system with um, heat grids and with uh, heat pumps and everything um, why we are not yet there with the complete hydrogen infrastructure. So this may solve a little bit the chicken and egg problem that we have because we can start changing one part of the energy infrastructure without the need of doing it all at once with a high risk of, of failing. Um, so we could avoid disruptive system restructuring, especially in the supply infrastructure, while we are already making the demand side ready for hydrogen. So hydrogen may also build bridges in relation to the to the resilience. So when we are talking about energy cells, so not a, a huge central system, but many small energy cells, then hydrogen could at a regional level um, be the technical solution to couple all local and regional energy pr production with the utilization in all energy demand sectors to secure the energy supply from the regional resources, also on a seasonal level, so throughout the year. And it is also decoupling the energy prices from the global markets so and from the global price mechanisms. So it may secure a long-term security also of cost because it is produced from renewable resources that is not um, taking part in the global energy markets. Um, at a national level, um, we could also increase the resilience of the energy 
um, system uh, when we are um, placing or when we are putting fuel cells in electrolyzers um, in, as an as an uh, management an energy management um, technology because both are capable of overloading. So this means that existing capacities just for the normal operation can be used to store surplus electricity due to overload operation or to just provide missing electricity um, also by overload operation of the fuel cell. So we can um, uh, include a flexibility in our system without the need to invest into additional just backup um, capacity. So this is something that we can use with the infrastructure that is set up for the normal situation and could be used in special conditions. Um, and then a third, uh, a third um, example of how um, hydrogen may build bridges is that it's also a solution for other challenges that regions face. So here, for example, it may support uh, the circular economy in the regions and increase economic viability and also uh, regional added values. Um, because hydrogen can not only be produced from um, water and electrolyzers, but it can use every regional resource or every organic compound or organic waste in the region. Um, and uh, from that, we can produce hydrogen via thermalizers or plasmalizers. So we have a flexible production of the various products. So depending on how we run the processes, we can either produce um, hydrogen or um, uh, and hydrogen and, and fixed carbon or black carbon, or we can boost, uh, produce diverse um, chemical compounds for chemical industries from our waste. So um, we can um, use these processes um, to produce hydrogen and at the same time have a CO2 sink if we're using bio waste, or um, we can use, uh, we can produce the same amount of hydrogen um, from, from waste um, with lower cost and also with lower um, electricity or renewable en electricity, external e electricity input. So this could be also an efficient way of um, just getting the energy out of our waste before disposal and um, yeah, and, and supporting the circular economy. So you see on the left side in the picture, we have the traditional way of using uh, biomass um, with, um, with uh, like burning it either in a car or a combined heat power plant and then releasing the CO2 that was in the atmosphere. So we have the, the photosynthesis circle, but we could also use either the biomass or fossil fuels or plastics or um, tires or whatever in a thermalizer and just produce hydrogen and um, chemical compounds or biochar or um, uh, black carbon without releasing CO2. So it's a, a green um, um, hydrogen production pathways from waste. And, and there we can, yeah, as I said, just uh, support the circular economy. So what would be the next step? So what are regions looking for? They say they are very interested in getting this hydrogen economy um, real into in their regions. So, but we see that there is a lot of new stakeholders um, um, who wants to, who want to become uh, regional stakeholders in the energy systems? Um, they have regional competence, so they have access to land, to networks, to local customers. So we have a huge potential for acceptance of this new energy um, economy, um, and they also have an influence the regional political decision making or decision making in companies or in society. Um, but um, they need to make decisions, at, as I said, under uh, uncertainty and investments and operational risks, and they need to be motivated um, as they are responsible for ensuring acceptance of the energy systems. So uh, what uh, do they need? So they need something that helps them in doing the decisions. So this is why we developed a scenario calculator. Um, uh, and I would like to just briefly explain what it means. So the scenario calculator is a tool that identifies a cost optimized target system for our hydrogen production plants for regions. So it can be regionally um, configured. And then this um, optimized uh, target system guarantees regional supply security uh, on a daily uh, basis if the set targets and framework conditions are met. At the same time, this system can also then in the second step um, gives uh, information to understand the system resilience and risk of changing uh, conditions um, 
because we included a stress test function so that you can change assumptions and see how this would affect um, your results of the, of the system. So this is a, a tool that is suitable for understanding and communication of options, um, alternative options uh, and strategies on how to set up a regional hydrogen economy. So this scenario calculator prototype was finalized in 2020 and the Toyota Mobility Foundation founded it. So, um, uh, and, and at the moment we are, um, we are um, finalizing the software platform in order to provide access to as many regions as possible. So everybody can configure its own region and find out what a suitable um, hydrogen infrastructure uh, could solve the, or could meet the regional energy um, um, economy. So uh, this uh, online platform will be uh, uh, finished by the end of this year. So in case you're interested, please feel free to uh, contact me. I'm at the end of my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nadine. Uh, I think we have to, we are running a bit out of time. So I think we have to <laughs> move straight away on to our next um, speaker, Roland Schulze, if that's okay with you. For, for me, Jakob, Roland? it's fine. For, yeah, for me, Jakob, it's fine. If I hope it's good for the audience. I, I can immediately jump into it if, if you want me to. Yes. Uh, so I try to... To share my screen, uh, I hope you can can see it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you again for for having me here. Uh, I think this is quite a a diverse set of presentations so far with, with very very comprehensive subjects. So uh, this is great to see, um, and I, I can only congratulate you for for the selection of, of these presentations. And now I come with another element uh, which could be boring. Um, this is a European Union and EIB financing, but, but let's see. Um, I, I take that many of the, of the participants in the audience are familiar with the, the EIB as such and the characteristics of it, so, so I will spare you this. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak about the nexus of climate neutrality, hydrogen and, and sustainable finance. Um, at EIB, um, we are looking at various business perspectives for hydrogen. So and I, I would like to share some of these with, with and some of the observations we make uh, with you. Uh, when it comes to financing hydrogen projects, the EIB, as the European Union's climate bank, has to consider such, such projects in the, in the context of the European Union policies. And of course, also in the context of our own frameworks, such as something called the energy lending policy and the climate bank roadmap. So therefore we, we follow closely and attentively the, the current hydrogen developments triggered by the EU policy impetus, for example, the EU Green Deal and other already mentioned policy frameworks, they, they advocate for a very, very strong system change. So what we did in that context is we, we made three ambitious commitments in 2019. So the first one was that we, will dedicate um, more than 50% of all our financing to climate action and environmental sustainability finance by 2025. Uh, second, we would like to support approximately 1 trillion euro of investments in the next decade to these two areas, climate action and environmental sustainability. And third, we we committed to align all our financing activities to the principles of the Paris Agreement by 2020. So th this is something we, we have already done. Um, here you see some, some details on the Climate Bank Roadmap and how it has been implemented and what it contains and how it is governed within the EIB. Um, it, it very much builds on, on the policy context. For the, for the hydrogen economy, we, we currently derive from the policy context the need for a number of things to happen. So making and using clean hydrogen at scale will require setting up of supply chains, a widespread infrastructure, and, and massive investments in additional production of renewable energy. First, though, the success of the hydrogen economy relies on public support, as we have heard, uh, all the, the funds which are available at the European Union. 
um, so in the form of subsidies, but also in the reforms of the carbon pricing and regulations on infrastructures. The, the European Union, as Peter has mentioned, has announced a hydrogen strategy that wants to support the scaling up of supply and demand for green hydrogen uh, to support new markets, the development of new markets, and also establish Europe as the leading uh, region for hydrogen industry so that more skilled jobs will be created. The, the main objective of the strategy is to reduce rapidly the, the price of green hydrogen by rolling out dedicated gigawatt scale green hydrogen factories. So um, the, the goal is six gigawatt by 2024. Uh, in a second phase by 202030, there should be 40 gigawatts of large scale electrolyzers based on renewable energy. And that will require, of course, additional dedicated wind and solar capacity. And then also the strategy addresses market and regulatory issues which are needed for hydrogen developments so that there are the, the appropriate market conditions. And then there is other policy uh, elements such as the trans-European networks, which will include battery and green hydrogen energy storage as eligible investments. And um, hydrogen is also included in the European Union's so-called important projects of common European interest, IPSE. So that inclusion means that such investments um, are entitled to receive grant money from the EU member states. In that context, Pedro mentioned it also, the member states have also published national hydrogen strategies. Um, and some other strategies are even further under the development. Um, and if one adds up their uh, envisaged electrolyzer capacity by 2030, um, one reaches approximately 28 gigawatt. Um, so that would be three quarters of what the European Union has set as, as 40 gigawatts. Um, the, the European Community's Joint Research Centre has made uh, an, an assessment of, of what investments would be needed for low-carbon hydrogen, although it is difficult to estimate given the difficult possible scenarios to achieve the European Union's decarbonization uh, target. Um, it also depends on, on the various ways carbon-free hydrogen would be produced. So anyway, if one would look at these scenarios on, 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 on the left-hand side, um, to reach this, it would either require a significant amount of additional carbon-free electricity, uh, and that amount is, is equivalent to approximately 80% of the European Union's total electricity production today. So hydrogen would then become the sector with the largest power consumption. Or alternatively, um, if one would uh, consider natural gas as a source for hydrogen production, um, the amount would be equivalent to approximately 45% of the European Union's current annual consumption. Um, but in addition to that, one would also need to capture 460 million tons of CO2 and to store it in around 150 large scale CO2 storage facilities. So in, these were the physical numbers, if, if you like. So in terms of investment, the first case, so electrification, would require 410 billion euros for the electrolyzer um, scenario. Um, just to produce the hydrogen, so approximately 900 gigawatt. And in addition to that, one would require 1.3 trillion euros for the renewable energy production. If one would build on natural gas, some 140 billion euros would be needed, mainly for steam reforming and carbon capture, but also investments for, of about 50 million euros annually for natural gas expenditures. 
So, Roland, hey, just, 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 I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm speeding. No, no, it, it's a, it, you have a sign saying stop sharing. Is it possible if you could uh, just hide it uh, on your screen? Oh, Can excuse you see me. It? Why is that? Uh, excuse me. Um, I'll reshare if, if that is possible. Is it gone, the sign? No, it, it, it's still there, but I think we, we can just move on. It's the, it's in the bottom. No, never mind. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, I'm a bit, I'm a, although engineer, so these technologies are oh, sometimes difficult. So, well, yeah, let me, I, I'm speeding up also in the interest of time. Um, so the, a recurrent theme for hydrogen production is, is that it says bridging the gap of the production cost with the expected revenue so to achieve financial viability. In our view, that, that's not really easy uh, because there are a number of policy elements which could contribute to the financial viability of green hydrogen, such as emission trading systems or other national support schemes. However, none of these send yet sufficiently strong signals to unlock potentially financially viable hydrogen investments. So unless there is a clear case for such a financial viability, there will be no scale up in investments to re-up the expected benefits of, of it. Um, yeah, we mentioned already the numer numerous instruments of the EU policy, uh, which could do that, but, um, and they are still in, in the phase of reforms and maybe they will then send the, the, the necessary signal. What we also hear often as bankers is, um, it is not a surprise that hydrogen is very costly. So the, many people say arguments extend, uh, come, I mean, many, many people say as an argument, um, this is because hydrogen is new, it is te technically immature. So, but on the other hand, um, I hope you can still see my slides. We know that the costs are actually determined by the centuries known laws of physics of the hydrogen processes and their associated inefficiencies. So th this leaves most likely only limited room for um, significant innovation uh, and improvements. Um, so competitiveness of green hydrogen over conventional alternative is estimated at two euros per kilogram of hydrogen. Uh, alternatively, one could consider a carbon price to make the conventional hydrogen more expensive. So that would be, for example, 120 euro per ton of CO2. And there are public estimates by Bloomberg, for example, or uh, other estimates by the Florence School of Regulation. They calculated a range of a needed carbon price um, between 120, uh, sorry, between 100 and 225 euros per ton of CO2. Uh, the difference or the range is um, a result of that one that they had considered different electricity sources to actually produce the hydrogen, so either photovoltaics or offshore wind. Uh, what we do at EIB is, and this is what you see on the slide, we also apply a shadow price of carbon when we assess our investments, and that shadow price of carbon reflects the 1.5 degrees Celsius target. Um, that um, shadow price is based on so-called integrated assessment models. And if you look at the cost curve, you will see that it is quite well aligned with the publicly quoted number. Um, however, costs are also determined by an underdeveloped scattered supply chain. We heard this. Um, small scale applications, small industries, and, and it seems that these industries, they have good reasons to, to take a wait and see approach and ramp up only when they clearly see demand for their components um, to, to arise. And, and there's apparently potential for leverage in, in there. So through that, through rollout and continuous deployment, economies of scale and cost reduction might be achievable. But they are all withheld in what we see uh, because there are question marks around the financial viability and, and economics. Um, I mentioned we have to follow EU policy. So there is a new additional element in the policy toolkit, which is the <clears throat> sustainable finance regulations and delegated acts thereof, 
One of the delegated acts is the so-called European Union taxonomy. Uh, the sustainable finance regulation puts a good degree of order into what should be considered as green. Um, and it contains, the delegated act uh, actually contains thresholds of carbon intensities for economic operations at which or below which the European Union can achieve carbon neutrality in 2050. So the, the carbon intensity threshold for hydrogen manufacture, manufacturing, pro, which was proposed in the preparation of this uh, legal act by an expert group, was 150 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour of electricity. The now delegated act, which came into force, contains a much stricter threshold, which is equivalent to approximately 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So these values are much below any current grid factor within any European member state. So the average um, European Union grid factor of electricity production is, is approximately 350 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. That would mean that hydrogen production from grid connected renewable energy sources would move us away from the path towards carbon neutrality in 2050 unless for if there would be, for example, a certification regime or, or something. Uh, to illustrate these inefficiencies I, I was drawing to earlier, I wanted to show you a very complicated diagram. And I hope you can see it despite of the stop sharing. But uh, I can probably hide it here. So, voila. Um, <clears throat> so this diagram shows the life cycle greenhouse gas emission intensities for various transport applications. The data were determined in an, in an extensive study by the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. At the bottom of the left diagram, uh, we see um, the carbon intensity um, of an electricity system um, as a function of the renewable energy penetration in that system. So now if we pick the light blue or the purple line, uh, which is either hydrogen used in fuel cells for cars or hydrogen for so-called e-petrol, we can see that both will only have the same carbon footprint than diesel in electricity systems with very high renewable energy penetration, so approximately 80 or 90 percent. So that would be equal to an emission factor of 100 grams per CO2, uh, 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour or 200 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. And in addition to that, both would still be worse than batteries, which is the yellow line. So th these, these obvious fundamentals seem to translate into the market for climate friendly cars. There are no sales for fuel cell vehicles in the last six years, as, as you can see here. I come quickly to, to the end. So let me briefly focus on, a, on another topic. Uh, more a financial topic. Studies have shown that with decarbonization, the energy system becomes more capital intensive. That implies that the price of capital, the weighted average of cost of capital, the WAC, is a key variable in the financial viability of a project. So to get the WAC down, it is of importance to mobilize equity and debt. However, one can only get an adequate portion of debt into a project finance structure if the risks are properly understood and addressed. Now, there is a close link between the risks and the uncertainties, in particular the policy uncertainty around the financial viability, the taxonomy, and so on. So in, in, in view of all this, it seems at present difficult for investors to fully understand the underlying economics of a hydrogen project, as they are lacking a full deck of cards. The timing, by the way, is an important topic too. In energy sector terms, 2050 is not far away, with asset lifetimes in the energy sector commonly exceeding 25 years markedly, there are only one or two possible investment cycles ahead of us. Hence, one would have to start immediately putting steel into the ground. Let me add some, some realism here. Big and complex hydrogen projects take considerable time. From a first moment a hydrogen project appears on a PowerPoint presentation until hydrogen is actually produced, 10 years easily pass. 
This is a long period if you do have only three decades to carbon neutrality from now on. There are not only challenges, but also positive elements. So since 2018, the bank financed demonstration projects in the hydrogen sector. These are projects that bring together the deployment of mobility assets, hydrogen distribution and hydrogen production. So let me show very, very briefly two examples, the details of which you could perhaps swiftly read by yourself. In addition to financing, the EIB provides support to hydrogen projects through so-called financial advisory across the value chain. So you see some examples here. And uh, various industrial bodies were seeking to enter into memorandum of understandings with the EIB. So I'd like to say that despite of the many question marks that remain, it is quite encouraging and striking to see so many industries and stakeholders being united in their conviction that hydrogen is the missing piece in the European Union's decarbonization puzzle. Um, maybe I was longer than I thought or you expected, but I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I thank you very much, Roland. I think it was very, very interesting. I thank all the speakers. and uh, But as, as I... I think, you know, we're, we're running a bit out of time, so I'm, I'm going to introduce mine. Uh, it's a fantastic presentation. So thanks for an excellent presentation. You see that from one of the at attendees as well. Uh, so now we're moving outside of Europe and into Canada. Uh, please, Pontus. Thank you so much, uh, Jacob. And uh, thank you all for very enriching presentations. It's been really valuable. Um, now we're going to another area. We're going to another world leader in uh, H2. Uh, Canada is actually one of the uh, 10 largest uh, exporter of uh, H2, but also a, a prominent actor in uh, hydrogen solutions. Uh, <clears throat> and, and we are very happy to have uh, two uh, very prominent speakers uh, from the Canadian H2 community that will uh, enhance our knowledge in uh, in what's going on uh, on the other side of the, of the pound. Um, first, uh, I would like to welcome Mark Kirby. He's the president and CEO of the Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. And we are so pleased that you had the ability and, and also uh, accepted our uh, last minute uh, invitation. Uh, it's been uh, really, we were really, really happy that you could uh, make it today. Uh, and I, uh, the uh, Canadian Association here has also been uh, instrumental in, in uh, providing uh, and developing the Canadian um, hydrogen strategy. And we are also very happy to have uh, Eric Chang with us. He is a Swedish expat, uh, but he is also a Canadian re a research chair in fuel. Um, uh, if you saw science and, and technology uh, development at uh, the School of uh, Mechanic Systems Engineering at Simon Fraser University in uh, Vancouver. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I would like to give uh, uh, the table or the screen uh, to Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, Pontus. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and hopefully you can see my screen now. Yes, perfectly. Great, that's good. Um, I'm joining you from North Vancouver uh, on Canada's west coast, and it is the uh, traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and uh, Seashell Nations. And I'm delighted again to speak with you today uh, and to talk a little bit about what's going on in Canada. Um, so CHFCA, Canadian Hydrogen Fuel Cell Association, we're a national association, been around for quite some time. And we represent our very active hydrogen fuel cell sector in Canada. And I'm also pleased that we're working closely with the uh, federal and some of the provincial governments on, uh, on implementing hydrogen and our hydrogen strategies, uh, co-chairing the, the steering committee and uh, working on certain of the, uh, the working groups under that. Uh, we have uh, uh, over 100 members, uh, you'll see, recognize a lot of the names there, but there's also some unique Canadian companies and a lot of uh, technology companies that are up and coming. Now, uh, what's going on in Canada? What's going on with industry? What's going on with government? Um, there's absolutely no way in the limited time I can cover this. Um, but, you know, summarizing, uh, and I'll touch on a few highlights in the, in the time I'm available, and Pontus, feel free to cut me off as soon as you, uh, as you need to, but... Uh, really want to highlight that 
it's been recognized in Canada that, that hydrogen is both essential to getting to net zero 2050 and a huge economic opportunity. Uh, we've also recognized in Canada, we have very good strengths, both in hydrogen and in fuel cells. Um, and so we want to be part of that. Uh, as such, there's a hydrogen strategy that has been put in place that provides a framework. And it's not only at national, we also have hydrogen strategies being put in place at provincial levels. Um, we have uh, policy and funding to back that up. Uh, it's both significant um, and one of the key things in Canada is it's very technical, technology neutral. So you won't see something specific for hydrogen, you'll see something specific for uh, clean fuels or for zero emission vehicles. Uh, or, and in cases like uh, in production technologies, it's not focused on a particular technology, it's focused on an outcome, you know, what is the carbon intensity. Um, there's an implementation plan that's been developed, which has engaged, which engages industry um, in, in how we're going to move things forward. We have significant projects underway and many more pending. And I think one of the most important things to point out here is we are actively pursuing international engagement, both at the government level and at the industry level. Our member companies make their living selling products around the, around the world. Uh, we're interested in international supply chains um, and developing those international supply chains. Canada is open for business. Uh, there is uh, lots of opportunities for European companies to invest in Canada and to sell products in Canada and to partner with Canadian companies. So I think it's uh, those are sort of the, the highlight and now I'll see what I can do to, to, to expand on that. From essential point of view, I think we all know uh, we need to go to net zero. That means we need to uh, scale up our, our net zero pathways Hydrogen is a key part of it, and we have to, have to scale up our hydrogen supply, clean hydrogen supply, very significantly. Good thing is that all these different pathways support each other. Clean power can be used to make clean hydrogen. Fossil fuels with CCUS can be used to make it, and hydrogen is required in biofuels and so on. So they all tend to work together. Uh, no one solution is going to be enough. There is going to be a mix of them. Um, hydrogen is a key part of it, and it's, we talked about it's needed for long haul, for heavy industries, for building heat, for energy storage. Key points, essential, and an economic opportunity. Um, so uh, the other point about it is there has been a lot of advances in hydrogen in the past little while, both in the production of clean hydrogen from various energy sources and in the fuel cell electric vehicles that are used to, to, um, to and other appliances that use clean hydrogen. Uh, and in the electric vehicle space, it's not just in the fuel cells, it's also in storage, it's in the electric vehicles themselves, the battery technology, the drive technology, all of that is advanced to the point that these are very viable products. And then last but not least, it's the, it's the policy, you know, that there is policy coming in place around the world to support these technologies. So timing is right. Uh, Canada has a lot of activity underway. I won't talk about it, but right across our country, I'm going to talk in detail, but right across our country, we have projects underway today in hydrogen, including some very significant projects, uh, major production projects, deployment projects, et cetera. We are a top, top 10 hydrogen producer. We have three merchant hydrogen plants and two more pending. We have leading clean hydrogen producer uh, today. In fact, I, I, near as I can tell, we are the largest producer of clean hydrogen today in the world. We are the cradle of PEM fuel cell technology, and we have a number of hubs they have also sometimes called the hydrogen valleys or nodes or uh, enclaves. We have a number of hubs on, in development. We have a very capable hydrogen and fuel cell uh, sector, uh, which covers the full value chain of in the hydrogen and fuel cell sector. Um, and as far as our strategy goes, the goal here is up to 30% of our energy coming from hydrogen abating 190 uh, megatons of CO2, roles in clean power, industrial processing, heating, transportation, big investment opportunity, up to 50 billion a year per se in the sector, uh, 350,000 jobs, and, and the goal to be a top three clean hydrogen exporter. These sort of numbers get the attention of, of politicians and get them excited, and therefore they want to be part of it. And our, our message to them is, Hydrogen, you know, there's so much activity happening in Europe, in California, in Asia, in hydrogen. It's going forward. It's really a question of how much of a role does Canada want to play in this? So as a result, there is a, a considerable activity in place. We have a federal framework, as mentioned. We have a revised climate plan. Some of the policy areas 
net zero commitment uh, by 2050 in place in Canada. We have price on carbon rising to $170 a metric ton by 2030, and all indications it will continue rising after that. We have a clean fuel standard to reduce our carbon intensity of our fuel pathway by 13% by 2030 and, and increasing from there on. We have zero emission vehicle mandates that will come in place uh, for light duty by 2035, and we expect them to be coming in place for heavy duty and other things. So there is policy. Uh, it is increasing, and we're in the midst of an election campaign right now. Basically, no matter what party comes in, they're all seeing the need for this. So there's going to be a continuation no matter what happens in our election. There's also funding. We have a $1.5 billion clean fuel fund. Um, that was just launched in July and uh, is closing shortly. And as I understand, and it provides up to 50% of funding for clean hydrogen projects. And as I understand, it is way oversubscribed. So already we're going to have at least 3 billion of, of additional hydrogen projects moving forward. That's a heck of an opportunity for, for suppliers and technology companies to take part in. We also have um, uh, infrastructure fuel funding. We have a, a, a $2.75 billion funding for zero emission buses, of which fuel cell buses qualify, but we need fuel cell buses. So that's another opportunity for uh, Swedish companies to, uh, to start uh, uh, selling uh, fuel cell electric buses in, in Canada. We have a $7 billion industry transformation fund that can be applied to infrastructure, uh, to transforming our, our, our processing industries, et cetera. So quite a bit of money available in Canada, international engagement, and it's not only the federal level, it's also at the provincial level. And in Canada, where we get unity between our provinces and our federal government, well, it's fairly exciting. So we're, we're uh, really quite optimistic about what's going forward. Partnership has, uh, you know, and again, I won't get into details, but you know, 30 recommendations in, in eight different pillars, well thought through. The key thing about it is the government is looking to drive this through a partnership between industry and government, uh, recognizing that this is going to take some significant effort to make sure these, these uh, recommendations are actually implemented. There's a strategic steering committee uh, involves industry and government and brings in all the key stakeholders, our indigenous population, our federal and provincial territories, uh, and all the different departments of government. And then where the work gets done is in the working groups. So uh, industry government led working groups. I'm proud to say the CHFCA is leading the urban transit one and the hubs one. And, but there's many others that are either started or will be kicking off shortly uh, to tackle, you know, what are the barriers? What are the opportunities in each of these sectors so we can actually get some action happening in those. We we'll also recognize that each of these areas has different needs and different drivers. Uh, so if you look at industrial processing, chemical refining, really what you're doing here is clean hydrogen is competing with coal or with gray hydrogen. We're seeing a lot of investment. I think that's common around the world because the economics here, when you start getting a price on carbon, when you start having a clean fuel standard, the economics make sense quite quickly uh, to start using clean hydrogen to lower the carbon intensity in each of these areas. Heating and combustion, uh, a little more challenging because here you're competing with natural gas, which is cheap and is fairly low carbon. But nonetheless, as you move forward and natural gas starts to become unviable to policy or whatever, then you're going to be providing a very good alternative to electrification by having a net zero gaseous heating system. Uh, energy storage and, and generation, that's really supporting clean power. Transportation, in this case, you're competing really against diesel and gasoline a much higher value products. So you can actually uh, be competitive at a higher hydrogen cost, but you do need in this case, not only the hydrogen supply, but you also need your hydrogen fueling infrastructure and you need your fuel cell electric vehicles. So it's a, it's a more complicated one, even though the economics here can, can, can work, at least on, on, in, in theory, uh, quite quickly. What we see that support all of them is Hubs are a key way to get the, by using uh, scale and proximity to reduce your hydrogen costs, get sustainable economics in place for these applications. And that of course leads to economic growth and GHG reduction. So it ex excites the, the uh, municipalities uh, and the areas to, to start seeing these hubs developing in their backyards. So we see a lot of activity and we are pushing a lot of activity for, in hubs. We have clusters forming in Vancouver, Alberta, and Quebec, uh, and we see that expanding as, as time goes on. Also on the clean hydrogen supply, <coughs> excuse me, this is a, you know, a, obviously a huge challenge. 
When we look at our demand in Canada in 2050, it's estimated at 20 million metric tons to hit our goals. Uh, and similar, if we want to stay in the, in the energy export business, we're going to need similar amounts for our export. That's more than a 10x scale up of our, of our current hydrogen production, and it all needs to be clean. If we do it all from renewable power, that's 130 gigawatts of power. That's a heck of a lot of power. Um, and that's a challenging amount. It's not impossible, but it's an a very challenging amount. And the concern is that if there is scarcity and or high cost, that it's not that we're just going to be able to do other things. What it's going to do is it's going to delay implementation and achieving our GHG emission reductions. It's going to disadvantage our industry and our consumers. And so what the Canadian government says is we really want to make sure that we get as much clean hydrogen available as possible. Also looking out, we have energy available, you know, as in around the world, Canada is a big country. Each of our regions has different energy resources. We have renewables, we have a big undeveloped wind capacity, we have a massive hydro capacity, although it is not got the same opportunity for continued expansion. We have some solar and some geothermal tidal. So we have renewables. We also have a big biomass opportunity um, and uh, with our forestry and agriculture industry, renewable natural gas, bio oils and ethanol. We have a major nuclear industry. Um, the world's largest nuclear plant is in Ontario, uh, almost eight uh, gigawatts of power production from that, uh, from that plant. Uh, and of course we have our fossil fuel sector, which we recognize is a key part of helping things move forward, moving things forward. So the Canadian approach is we're regulating the outcome and not the pathway, supporting clean hydrogen from all energy sources, and frankly giving, custom, frankly, giving customers what they want. So if Sweden wants hydrogen from renewable sources, great. That is what we will provide as a country. Um, but in each of these areas, we will regulate and monitor the carbon intensity. So whether it's being produced from fossil fuels with sequestration or whether it's being produced from our power source, in Canada, we have and are putting in place through our uh, price on carbon and our clean fuel standard, uh, Beth is to monitor, regulate, and track the GHG intensity of all these pathways. And in also to encourage low carbon pathways and penalize high carbon pathways. So the concerns such as raised in the recent Cornell paper about you know, using blue hydrogen leading to high GHG emissions, well, if they do, then they will be uneconomical and won't be able to move forward. So the goal here is to allow industry uh, and our innovation to find the best ways of making clean hydrogen, regulate and monitor and reward and uh, the, the production of low carbon intensity hydrogen. Uh, all this is leading to a lot of projects. We have a very active research and development. Uh, we have a cluster. I, I, again, there's lots of things going on. I, I don't have time to go into it all, but I'd be happy to talk about it. Uh, you know, a couple of things about clean hydrogen production. You know, many projects underway. An example is our Beconcour Quebec electrolyzer project. It's the largest PEM electrolyzer project in the world. Uh, and it's, it's fully in commercial application. It's, it's producing hydrogen, which is shipped around North America uh, for use in industry and competes with, uh, with, with hydrogen from all other sources. Um, and, uh, and, and we see many other projects, both in, the, um, in, in clean hydrogen, both from, uh, from, from many energy sources. We have hubs underway. Alberta's got one of the largest hubs uh, in place and growing. And, and because it can offer very low cost, hydrogen is attracting uh, uh, industry and, uh, and, and new deployments in transportation and heating and industrial processing. Uh, we have our world leading, probably the world leading PEM fuel cluster centered in Vancouver with many companies, uh, support, innovation, research, partnerships, uh, et cetera. It's a unique asset that we have that, um, that we encourage you to, uh, to, uh, to tap into, frankly. Um, and uh, many opportunities for collaboration. Yeah. We have collaboration with members in research and in, in getting products, services. Uh, we have opportunities for hydrogen exports using our low-cost energy resources. Uh, we have many events and, and, and so on to partner on. And also um, investment import opportunities for, for fuel cell technologies and products. You know, we, we need, we need uh, OEMs to be selling their products in Canada. We have mm -hmm. projects that are available for investment, technology companies that need uh, sector investment, and opportunities for investment um, in terms of uh, branch facilities, access to that massive market that is south of us uh, through our free trade agreement. Um, you know, we've got a great investment climate, expertise, and so on. So, um, you know, the key message is 
if there's interest, please do contact us. Um, we are, you know, Canada is very much open for business. We can offer a lot of, uh, uh, of opportunities. And I do encourage uh, people to, to reach out and see, what's, uh, see what they can do to partner with Canadian companies. Thanks for Thank you so much, Mark, for a very interesting pre presentation and the invitation to collaborate. I, I guess there's a huge opportunities for new fuel cell technologies for, for like uh, trucks, manufacturers, truck manufacturers in Europe, really engaging uh, the, the, with the all inclusive strategy work you have. Uh, there's so many uh, questions and discussions I would like to make, but unfortunately we, we do not have time. Really encouraging too that uh, uh, the, the potential like 350,000 work uh, opportunities uh, might uh, lead to, to uh, a, a secure outcome from your election. September 20th. So um, without further ado, I would like to uh, invite uh, Eric uh, to uh, the screen, so to say. And Eric, he has been working uh, with a lot of long-term uh, projects with industry, and uh, it would be very interesting to hear more about the industry academic collaboration that you are working with. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pontus, for the introduction and also for inviting me to participate in, in this session today. Um, good, uh, good afternoon in Europe and uh, good morning from Vancouver, Canada, uh, on the southern side of the city, Mark, from, from my home office. <laughs> um, so uh, I will start sharing my slides. Eric, um, it seems like there's some echo in your uh, sound system. Could you check that? I apologize for that. I don't know if I have a solution. No. Is it better um, now? Yeah, I think it's better now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If you lean forward, I guess it's better. Okay. Um, okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Good. Okay. Hopefully this will work. I apologize. Um, so um, I'm uh, Eric Hiam. Again, I'm, I'm um, uh, a dual citizen of, of Canada and Sweden, um, proudly so, uh, originally from Sweden. I've been in Canada for 17 years, and I'm a professor, uh, actually promoted as of today, September 1st, and Canada Research Chair in Fuel Cell Science and Technology Development, and I direct the Fuel Cell Research Lab, uh, FCL, at Summer Fraser University, SFU. And today I will talk about hydrogen uh, innovation achieved through university industry research partnerships. Um, just quickly about uh, my university, SFU, um, it's considered an engaged university um, and promoted as such, engaging students, uh, research, and, and communities. And we often work in close partnerships with the communities, and in, in my case, the industry. Um, SFU is Canada's leading comprehensive research university, which means that it's a university that does not have a medical school. Um, it has three campuses in the three largest municipalities in uh, in British Columbia, um, in Vancouver, and uh, 35,000 students, 150 programs, including the mechatronic systems engineering and sustainable energy engineering programs that I'm personally involved in. And this field has a major focus on, on energy and, and hydrogen uh, is, is uh, a major activity. Uh, uh, could you try to take away your earphones and unplug it? Mike, uh, do you think it might work better? Okay, is this better? Yeah, if you pull them out from the... Yeah, is it better? Is okay. it better? Uh, it, no, it's similar. So uh, please continue and I won't dis disturb you anymore. Unfortunately, I think the sound is, is probably a problem with my laptop. Um, I don't think I have a solution. Um, I will just try and speak clearly and hopefully it will work. Um, okay, so the project I wanted to highlight today is, is a collaboration between industry and uh, universities. And it's on heavy duty fuel cells for transit buses, focusing on enhancing durability and reliability. It was a collaboration between uh, Bauer Power Systems as an industry partner and Simon Fraser University and University of Victoria Universities um, in BC. And uh, this project uh, you know, taps into the opportunities of zero emissions and uh, route flexibility enabled by fuel cell bus technology 
um, and addresses the challenges of lifetime and reliability, whereas the capital cost is, is also a challenge in this case. Um, the project uh, was, was the original project was to increase the stack durability, targeting 20,000 hours of lifetime. Um, now I think the targets have increased even further to 25 or even 30,000 hours. Um, this was sort of done a few years ago, this project, and also to develop lifetime predictions and tools for that uh, using accelerated testing and empirical and fundamental models. Uh, we also contributed to diagnostics and safety systems um, to, to make these buses more, more competitive. Yeah, the project leverages um, a cohesive research team of complementary expertise and facilities. From the industry side, uh, Ballard uh, provides, of course, um, four years of, of, of background and, and uh, knowledge and industrial directions, right? Um, they provide uh, field operator uh, member electric assemblies from, from actual um, uh, buses operating in the field, um, historical data on durability and failure analysis. Uh, diagnostic methods and also uh, knowledge um, and testing infrastructure and manufacturing processes and know-how that we can leverage for the project. The university is also an equally important role for the success of the project, contributing the fundamental expertise, um, mechanistic studies that, are, um, that the, the industry does not have the resources to do, um, developing new methods, for example, for measuring, measuring properties of materials, analytical equipment that the industry doesn't have, and then modeling um, developments as well, as well as other things. And together, by, by leveraging the inputs from both industry and universities, uh, we're able to uh, address these, these very challenging project outcomes of, of, of uh, increasing the durability, um, and predict, uh, facilitate lifetime predictions and in diagnostic systems. Okay, um, so um, just a couple of highlights about uh, the technical work on this project, and I'm going to focus on the empirical lifetime prediction approach that we, we developed. And it uses uh, both the fundamental um, research on, on understanding the degradation mechanisms and empirical data from uh, a lot of range of accelerated stress tests that were pursued in the lab. Um, so specifically, we investigate the effect of different stressors on the degradation process and, and test lifetime, for example, temperature, relative humidity, and cell voltage and their interactions. And this allows us to establish um, the prediction models. So we have these design curves for, for the effect of different stressors uh, on, on the test lifetime um, that we uh, deploy. And we combine that with, with actual data from field operations. And, and these are data for, uh, from um, the, the fuel cell buses in, in Whistler, in this case, um, uh, the operating parameters, operating conditions, and so on, and also data on the actual degradation fingerprints that were observed for field operations and failures, failure modes. Um, and then when we combine that with the fundamental approach, we're able to produce the lifetime predictions. And also, if we have access to field data, we can also use that to improve the models uh, once uh, lifetime is better understood in, in the field. So we used data from the, the Whistler BC Fields and Bus project, which operated in parallel with the research project uh, back then. It started with the Vancouver Olympics in, in 2010. Um, and this is an example of you know, the module current from the fuel cell module um, over time during the bus operation. I've highlighted a portion here that actually the buses that spend a lot of time idling um, at bus stops, at uh, traffic lights, and also decelerating, of course. Um, and these are low currents, meaning high cell voltages, which is a stressor for, for degradation. Um, the bus project was, was a successful one, and it was quite a challenging one because uh, they replaced the entire fleet of, of buses in which there are 20 buses in total with hydrogen fuel cell buses. Um, and uh, they had to operate through, through the winter with lots of snow and cold temperatures, a um, mix of snow and ice and water, I guess. And uh, also through the summer, which are very dry and hot up in, up in Whistler. Um, so by applying the model to the case of Whistler, we see fuel cell buses, uh, we were able to predict the lifetime. And these are the unreliability curves, which are cumulative distribution functions for, for lifetime. In red is the initiation time, where um, hydrogen leaks can first be measured. And in blue is the failure time that we predicted uh, when the uh, 
uh, this number was actually at the stock uh, being operated. And we were able to predict um, a B10, uh, which is where 10% of the, the MEAs um, it either initiated or failed as 12,000 hours or close to 19,000 hours uh, lifetime, which, uh, which was pretty close to our target, um, but didn't quite meet, meet that target with the pre-existing technology, right? So there was additional work that had to be done to, uh, to get to the 5,000 hour target. Uh, how do we develop such a model? That's a, another really important part, um, and which is possible through this university industry collaboration, because through the, the uh, RAS program in Whistler, we were able to get stacks uh, after the end of the program into the lab so that we could perform diagnostics. And we used this so-called hydrogen nitrogen test or H2N2 test um, to measure uh, cell voltages under hydrogen nitrogen conditions um, to estimate hydrogen leaks across the membrane of the cells. Um, and we have a, a staff that were operated for 9,800 hours in the field, and uh, the tests suggested that we had 1.5% leak initiation in 1.5% in of, of the cells. And this was actually very similar to the uh, uh, life prediction model that predicted 2.5% of the MAs to have initiated with leaks after 9,800 hours. So this was considered a validation of the model, actually, with actual real field operation, operation uh, results. And now with the validated model, we can then apply it to the advances that we're doing on, on the research front. And in this case, add the life enhancing agent or LDA. In the accelerated stress test, the baseline failed after about 300 hours. And with the LDA added, it ran for over 1600 hours. Uh, so more than five times as much without actually reaching failure. However, the LEA itself, uh, we also have to consider the stability of the LEA, and it does leach out over, over time. And we apply a reverse acceleration factor for that in the lifetime prediction model. And then with the LEA present, we predict a lifetime that actually exceeds 30,000 hours. Um, so this actually meets the project objectives and is validated as, as such with, with the field data to be a pretty strong contribution from, from the project. Some key takeaways here. Um, the uh, university industry recent partnerships are mutually beneficial. They benefit the university by um, providing uh, industrial relevance and directions, um, and of course, very practical outcomes that are contributed by the research community as well as the, the community at large. Uh, for the industry, they provide the fundamental expertise and a deep dive into the uh, solving the problems that are in front of them. So removing barriers for, for hydrogen energy together. Uh, it's usable um, because of the industry participation, um, more useful, useful perhaps than, than the scientific publication itself. And uh, we provide a direct pathway to end users, which is really important, right? So with the fuels of manufacturers, as Ballard in this case, um, to put into products, and they can do that even during the project by taking uh, early outcomes from the project and bringing it into the products. And with this project, that was not necessarily possible because the program ended in, in the middle of our project, but in future bus projects, that's certainly being, being, being pursued and enhancing the lifetime as, as a result. Um, the added value is also student training, which should not be neglected. Uh, this is the future workforce of, of the industry. And for the Whistler BC fuel cell bus fleet, uh, this is yet a gold medal. Um, the, uh, the project was successful and it was a great technology showcase. It was only five years in duration and the buses actually had potentially a longer lifetime that was not being utilized because the economics were not there um, to continue the project at the end of the five year period. And that was primarily because of um, the, the high cost of the hydrogen fuel supply. So even though the buses were available and the transit agency did not have to um, purchase buses at that stage, they already had them, uh, they were not able to continue operating them because of the cost of bringing hydrogen in, uh, in this case from uh, electrolysis um, produced hydrogen in, in Quebec, so tracked across, across the country. So you know, in the future, it makes sense to, to um, integrate this project more with, with a community and, and maybe with more local uh, sources of, of hydrogen. Uh, to achieve better, better sustainability. Okay. So, uh, are you uh, close to wrapping up? Yeah. Um, continuous target government support is really critical uh, for these markets. And I think involving university and private sector partners uh, along the way is, is also really important. So, we have the government leadership in Canada now with the hydrogen strategy announced last year, as mentioned by Mark in the previous presentation. Hydrogen's time has come. 
and I'd like to um, thank our um, students, uh, partners, and sponsors, as well as everyone here for, for your attention. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, really impressive with this close collaboration with industry and uh, academia, uh, enhancing each other's knowledge. Um, just very, very briefly, like, because the time is up, but um, ha have some of your um, work and collaboration like uh, ended up in, in, in products uh, for the European market. Uh, are you now developing something in collaboration with Europe? Is something going on? Please, very, very briefly. Sure, thank you. I'll just, um, my example I can give you is, is the London UK fuel cell buses that have also been running for many years. Um, and the, I think the world record on, on fuel cell bus lifetime actually is held by that project. And it did exceed 20,000 hours. And this was a bus that was able to deploy some of the uh, durability enhancement strategies, not the ones where we're adding in the LEO necessarily, but um, some of the other knowledge that was gained from this project was, was used for, for that project. Okay. Um, and also we collaborate um, with international research collaborations with, with the EU. Um, we have a new project with, uh, with Germany on mm -hmm. low-cost durable fuel cells that, that I personally am very excited about. Excellent. Thank you so much for this enlightenment. Uh, and uh, I think we have a clear message from the both Canadian speakers uh, inviting us uh, and, and showing us the possibilities for collaboration, like EU-Canadian collaboration. And uh, now I would like to give over the uh, screen uh, to Roland uh, Elander. Yes, thank you very much. It's been uh, almost overwhelming with all, all the new initiatives, the great funding, uh, looking at industrialization, both from everything from, from uh, laws of physics to, to CapEx. Uh, and this has all been very informative for us. So we thank all panelists very, very much for this. You're over time. So I just would like to invite you. Next seminar will be on the 17th of November at 9 CET. So hope to see you then. And you will all get this with the link for YouTube. So you can watch it again or go back to it later on. Thank you very much for today. Thanks all. Thank Bye. You.